Thank you all for standing by and welcome to the second webinar of our fall series entitled Recent Trends in Heavy Precipitation in the Great Lakes. These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by OSU Extension, Ohio Sea Grant, Bird Polar Research Center, and six other OSU departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lakes residents. I am Jill gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Dave Kristovich from the University of Illinois. Dr. Kristovich is the head of the Center for Atmospheric Sciences in the Illinois State Water Survey, an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Illinois, and the editor for the Journal of Applied Meteorology and Climatology. Dr. Kristovich's research focuses on how the surface affects the atmosphere, from the very small sizes up to the size of storms in the Great Lakes region. We're delighted to have him here today to discuss the recent severe weather we've been having here in the Great Lakes and how a changing climate could affect what we will experience in the future. But before we do that, a few logistical issues as we get started. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, we'll conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Kristovich at the end of his presentation. We have more than 100 participants on this webinar, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep those questions coming throughout the presentation, and we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. Without any further delay, I would like to introduce Dr. Dave Kristovich from the University of Illinois, who will present recent trends in heavy precipitation in the Great Lakes. Dr. Kristovich, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe one, right? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Jill, I appreciate your help during this, and I'm very honored to be uh, invited to give a presentation as part of the uh, OSU Climate Change uh, webinar series. Uh, that, that truly is a, a great service. Um, today I'm going to talk a bit uh, about uh, heavy precipitation in the Great Lakes and how that has changed um, over the past hundred years or so, and um, give a little bit of an outlook on, on how it may uh, be changing into, into the future. Uh, this, uh, the material I'm presenting is the work of quite a few people, and I'm going to try to mention their names uh, throughout the presentation, um, but a few of them are listed here, and our funding agencies are National Science Foundation and NOAA. Okay, so um, why are we worried about uh, heavy precipitation? Well, I'm going to talk about uh, two types of uh, pre uh, precipitation during this, uh, uh, during this talk. Uh, one is just heavy, uh, uh, heavy precipitation of any sort, although it's usually in the form of rain um, in the Great Lakes region. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about lake effect snowstorms. Regardless of how the precipitation occurs, though, uh, it can have some uh, very, uh, very heavy precipitation can have some large influences on uh, communities both right next to the shorelines as well as uh, well inland from the lakes. Uh, these are just a few of examples, uh, a very few examples of some impacts. Um, Great Lakes water levels, uh, they change quite a bit. Uh, here we have a, um, an image of uh, back in 1986 when there was um, uh, when there was uh, the water levels were actually on the low side. Uh, this is uh, in, in uh, western Lake Michigan area. And you can see this rather large area that's um, uh, been now exposed uh, there with the water well to the uh, pretty far away. Uh, if you look at these roads here, you can see that in 1999, 
those roads were awfully close to the water. The, the uh, lake level had risen. And um, over the next uh, few years after this, you could see the, the marsh grasses grow and, and, and change. So the um, so water level changes are actually very important, um, affecting such um, uh, such things as uh, the ability or the uh, occurrence of damage during uh, particularly severe storms. When the uh, lake levels are high, uh, the the water is uh, moves further inland than it would usually and under lower conditions, and that means that when we have waves on top of the on top of the water. Uh, there's much more potential for it to, to damage uh, structures uh, further inland. Uh, so here, uh, this is a, a, a storm picture, picture showing some really impressive waves coming in on the uh, uh, coming into the shoreline, and you can see where it's hitting some rocks and spraying up into the air. Um, this lower image here is some storm damage uh, in the Illinois um, uh, Indiana Dunes uh, State Park area. Uh, a few years back, uh, during a during a storm uh, when there were high lake levels, so um, so there are some direct impacts from the lake, moving from the lakes, moving a little further away from the lakes. Uh, severe weather is a common occurrence in the Great Lakes area, and um, I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, this is a uh, storm that was studied by Tom Workoff during, uh, as he was uh, working on his master's thesis here at the University of Illinois. And it's a storm back in 2005, which developed into a squall line. Uh, you can see time progressing from the upper left, moving to the right. The storm's organized into a line. That line hit the shoreline at, during, uh, at 1853, approximately. And after that time, uh, the storm's Speed, uh, speed it up and uh, moved rapidly both to the east and to the west, uh, both to the east and to the south, causing quite a bit of damage in the area of, of uh, northwestern Ohio, western Pennsylvania, and uh, parts of western New York. Uh, a couple of examples of that. Um, these are just, I'm going to go through these rather quickly. These are from the Erie Times, uh, showing damage in the Erie, Pennsylvania region. And uh, some very large trees were blown down by the very strong winds that developed as the storm system crossed the lake. So some very impressive, very large trees that, that were taken down uh, during this event. There's a little, uh, you can see how this, the uh, tree had been twisted by the uh, variations in the wind uh, near the tree, and that caused kind of a twisting motion. Uh, but as you can see, this house was very, very lucky. It got missed by this uh, particular tree. There are some branches on the tree, I mean on the house uh, higher up. Uh, this house wasn't quite so lucky. A tree came down um, uh, through an addition on this uh, particular house. Uh, so some very impressive storms can occur over the Great Lakes area, and those uh, are influenced um, by, uh, on, to a rather large degree. Um, by the lakes themselves. The lakes tend to change the storms, and we're doing a lot of research on that. Uh, further away from the lakes, uh, inland flooding, these are a few pictures from uh, the July uh, 2011 uh, flooding in, uh, in Ohio uh, some, uh, from Newsnet 5, uh, some um, uh, extreme flooding in the region. So uh, variations in precipitation are uh, very important and ha can have very large impacts on society, on economy, agriculture, um, ecology, many other uh, fields, and, and this webinar series uh, actually highlights many of them uh, quite well. Many of the impacts quite well. Now, how do you uh, so how do you decide whether or not their uh, precipitation has been changing over time? Well, the simplest thing to do is to look at a time series. So this is a plot of the. Uh, daily precipitation, uh, every 24 hours uh, precipitation is measured, uh, in, in this case the Champaign, Illinois area. And you can see there's a lot of variability. There are a few uh, very heavy storms that dropped three, four, in one case over five inches of, of precipitation. But there are an awful lot of, um, uh, awful lot of days where there's very little precipitation or none. Um, the question is, 
has this, is this changing? Does this plot show that precipitation has been uh, varying? Well, one way to look at that is to uh, plot a line on this to, to uh, see whether or not there's an upward trend. You could check it statistically and see if, uh, if there's uh, strong evidence that, that there's a, a change over time. Uh, if you just look at this qualitatively, you, you very easily can, your eyes drawn rather quickly to things like these peaks in the 1920s and uh, very early 1930s. Uh, this lower er where this lower area where there weren't extreme precipitation events in the 60s and 70s, uh, this large peak in 1990. But it's a little bit deceiving because what you're seeing here is your eye is drawn to these extreme events here, and those are very stochastic. Uh, if we looked at another location such as Cleveland, Ohio, uh, this would look quite different. The individual daily uh, peaks would be different. So you have to be careful how you look at long-term uh, uh, time series of any uh, kind of meteorological data set. Um, if you were to draw a trend line on here using um, uh, least squares, single line type of uh, a linear trend type of analysis, uh, that's uh, what this is the line that you would get. You can see it's very close to the bottom, it's very low precipitation, uh, and, the re and really no evidence of an increase. Or, or decrease with time. Um, and that's the reason it's so low, is that it doesn't rain most days. That's something we all know from, from experience. But what we really tend to care about are these high precipitation amounts. So how have they changed? Well, this is a time series uh, 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 prepared by Amanda Jones at the University of Illinois, looking at the number of days each year from 1890 to 2010 uh, the number of days each year where there was over a half inch of, of rain at, in Champaign. And you can see that it's actually a rather dramatic increase, uh, changing from uh, on the order of 21 or 22 days per year uh, in the late 1890s, or in the 1890s, increasing to uh, around 27 or so uh, days per year uh, closer to today rather steady and rather striking um, uh, increase here. The important point to remember uh, with this, these two graphs that I showed you is that you can have very different trends with your total precipitation and your extreme precipitation. For example, we saw uh, really no trend in the total precipitation uh, that we, uh, when you plot every day, but on top of that, you, uh, we have an increase in the heavy precipitation events. And that's something that, that we'll come back to when we talk about the future uh, type of uh, the, uh, what we might expect in the future. Uh, looking at this a little bit more quantitatively, um, back in, 19, in 2003, uh, Ken Kunkel and Dave Easterling and, and um, others looked at uh, precipitation trends throughout the lower 48 states you, based on these sites. And these sites are... Um, uh, NOAA cooperative sites, uh, generally speaking volunteers, uh, who go out and take daily observations or organizations that go out and take daily observations. And they looked at all the sites that had a long time series of data and, um, and uh, had good quality control. The data looked uh, quite believable. And they combined those to get a um, get uh, to develop what they called a frequency index. The frequency index uh, takes into account such factors as the fact that the um, observations are not uniform throughout the U.S. You can see in the uh, upper Midwest region, there are a lot of people out there taking observations, far fewer sites taking observations of precipitation in the West. So the index takes those types of uh, variations um, into account. So the trend that uh, they saw uh, that, uh, with their analyses um, was generally a 17% uh, per century increase in the occurrence of extreme precipitation. And extreme precipitation uh, in their definition and our definition is the upper 20% of, of, of the uh, heaviest days of precipitation. So nice increase, uh, just to give you an idea of, 
of where that occurs and how it occurs. Uh, this blue line is uh, just the precipitation events during August, September, and October. Uh, you can see a very steady increase, roughly almost the same as the uh, national total, um, showing that most of the increase that we're seeing is occurring during the warm uh, months, particularly the fall months. Uh, this particular study uh, uh, examined the uh, tropical cyclones and, um, and the heavy precipitation events associated with them. And you can see that's also increasing, that, that when a tropical cyclone comes inland, uh, it's more likely to have extreme precipitation than it used to. Now, how about the Great Lakes area? Well, this is the total amount of um, the total uh, frequency index for the Great Lakes region. Uh, and you can see there's a very steady increase uh, through, uh, from the early 1900s, 1908 is the first data set, data point, to 2010. Um, and your eye is very quickly drawn to the fact that it's a, a, a general increase. If you look carefully, however, you'll see that it really isn't uniform. The precipitation uh, index, the frequency index increases somewhat in the early 1900s, but stays roughly about constant. Uh, into the 1980s even, when there's a, and then there's a large increase uh, at the end. So, uh, so extreme precipitation in the Great Lakes is not uh, uh, very uniform uh, in time, but it does have a general, or has had a general increase with time. Now, over the past uh, few years, uh, a group of us have been looking at all 20,000 extreme precipitation events throughout the U.S., uh, and identifying what types of meteorological event were related to them. Uh, a lot of this was, work was done by Leslie uh, Stucker and Becky Smith, um, and um, uh, really was a tremendous uh, long-term um, uh, process to, to uh, develop, to look at the meteorology from, from all of these events. And what was found for the Great Lakes area is that the heavy precipitation events associated with fronts uh, occurred most often. The, most of the heavy rain in, in the Great Lakes area comes along with uh, cold fronts or warm fronts. And we do see that distinct increasing trend uh, that we saw with the total amount of heavy precipitation. Uh, the lower curve is tropical cyclones. And believe it or not, Great Lakes do, do get uh, heavy tropical cyclones. Uh, uh, student Paul Gasecki is looking at that. And um, uh, and those are usually remnants of storms that hit either the Gulf Coast or the East Coast. And you can see that there are some very uh, uh, heavy precipitation events associated with tropical, tropical cyclones. The trend isn't so obvious in the Great Lakes area. Uh, there are some other uh, types of events that uh, produce heavy precipitation, uh, extra tropical cyclones, those low pressure systems you hear about, especially in the fall and winter. Um, and those, uh, those also exhibited a, a positive trend with time in the Great Lakes area. So, um, so that's total precipitation, and that had, uh, has quite a bit of uh, uh, impacts, as I said, uh, ranging from flooding to, to damage to uh, extreme storms. Um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and go into the winter. Um, this is another impact of the Great Lakes on uh, heavy precipitation in the Great Lakes area, and, and everyone living in the Great Lakes area are very familiar with lake effect snowstorms. And um, these are just a few uh, pictures from the Weather Service office in Buffalo, New York, um, and uh, showing some uh, very deep snow, pretty uh, impressive snow amounts. You get some very uh, interesting um, uh, patterns. I believe this is on top of a mailbox. Um, but very heavy, deep uh, snow that uh, occurs uh, frequently, almost every year, in, in parts of the Great Lakes area. Um, the plot on the right shows the population uh, near each of the uh, Great Lakes from the um, from Glarol, from the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, uh, showing that the the lakes that produce snow have the potential to affect an increasing number of people, increasing number of buildings, uh, more traffic that's affected. So even if lake effect precipitation doesn't change over time, it would have the potential to affect more and more people and cause more and more damage just because the people are, uh, there are more people in the way of the storms. But what we wanted to understand is 
how would lake effect uh, storms change over time? Well, uh, first of all, where does lake effect occur? Lake effect, um, lake effect is defined as precipitation uh, that would not have occurred if you didn't have, if there were no um, if the lakes weren't present. Um, so, for example, when cold air blows across the Great Lakes in the fall, when the lakes are still warm, uh, you can get clouds and, and snow or rain develop over the lakes. That wouldn't have occurred if the lakes weren't there to supply heat and moisture to the atmosphere. So that's a pure lake effect event. Uh, lake effect can also modify large-scale systems or, or other types of precipitation systems, making them heavier uh, than they would have been if the lakes weren't there. So we wanted to find a way that looks at uh, uh, these various types of, of, of lake effect uh, influences. Uh, lake effect snow, we've been looking at this for a long time. Um, uh, lake effect snow uh, comes in many varieties. If you look at the radar or satellite images over uh, during the winter months and fall and winter months, you can see some very uh, uh, exciting types of, of precipitation bands. On the right is a snow band that developed uh, over uh, eastern Lake Michigan, uh, initially developed as, as a line of precipitation, eventually formed into this uh, braided pattern. And, and if you look uh, carefully, you can see there are little uh, eyes, like we see in hurricanes, little uh, low precipitation eyes right in the middle. And if you look at the Doppler uh, winds, which I don't show here, you can see that each of these little braids represents a little uh, mini cyclone, a little low uh, uh, cir circulations that are going in circles uh, around these uh, clear areas. Um, that was a study by uh, uh, Joe Grimm, uh, Neil Laird, and uh, and others looked at uh, another large type of um, circulation that developed over Lake Michigan came blasting into the state of Michigan, uh, dropping three to four inches of snow for a short period of time. In, in some areas around here. So lake effect storms come in many different ways, uh, varieties, and I wanted to give you kind of a flavor of, of how these lake effect storms develop. What do, what do they look like? What is the process by which they form? So what we have here is a uh, visible satellite image. Uh, if you were standing on the satellite, this is what you would see if you had really good eyesight. And uh, this was a case back, uh, an event back in January of 1998, when very cold winds were blowing from the southwest, west-southwest on this day, uh, moving across the snow-covered uh, Illinois and Wisconsin area. Uh, we know that uh, there are clear skies there because you could see the individual little rivers that, uh, uh, over which the, the snow melted. And so you had clear, cold air blowing over the lake. Uh, lake Michigan was um, approximately 15 degrees uh, warmer than the, air, than the air that was flowing right over it, and that develops a, a great deal of instability. And that means that the air just above the lake is trying to move uh, vertically, trying to move up into the atmosphere. There's a lot of mixing. It's like what would happen if you turned on a, um, uh, had a pot of water and put it on a, uh, a stove, for example that the warm, uh, less buoyant air would, uh, does tend to, to want to rise. And the, the result of that is the, the development of clouds over the lake. Uh, about midway over the lake, we started seeing some snow. And all along the uh, eastern shore of uh, Lake Michigan, we had clouds that extended across the lake, even uh, making it all the way to Lake Huron and into, um, into Canada. So what the initial process by which all the action occurs, it, in this case, is near the upwind shore when you have these clear skies and the development of a few clouds right how, uh, when the storm first started. Well, to give you a sense of what that looks like, I'm going to show you a video that was taken um, on, on board the University of Wyoming King Air. Uh, we were conducting a project taking atmospheric measures from uh, two aircraft over Lake Michigan on this, um, on this day. And what I'm going to show you is just a short clip to give you an idea of, of how the storm initially developed. Um, just to point out a couple of things, at this, at this point we're flying to the west. So you can see clear skies uh, over, uh, over Wisconsin. You can see a little bit of the land, uh, a little bit of the land area on the, um, 
uh, right on uh, at the edge of the um, of where you could see, and a few clouds. So we were in the initial cloud development. So let's see. Okay, I'm having a little trouble getting the uh, uh, seeing the video here. Well, perhaps we can come back to that in a little bit. So, um, okay, well, I can make that available online for for other people to see. But as you fly through, what you see are uh, the aircraft turns around. You see. Uh, uh, these clouds build up. Snow develops rather uh, rather rapidly in these clouds. In fact, we saw a little bit of snow even in this area where there were very few clouds, uh, and some really intense uh, upward and downward motions called convection. And um, a little vortex formed under this cloud, for example, that we flew through. So what has Lake Effect done uh, over, the, uh, over the past 100 years or so? Well, uh, there are quite a few, uh, several studies out there that have asked that question, how has lake effect changed? And um, uh, this is just one example. Uh, Burnett, uh, Adam Burnett et al. in uh, 2003 uh, looked at uh, snow observations near the lakes, uh, the eastern lakes, and um, also in areas far from the lakes, and compared them and found that, well, even though the general snowfall in the region isn't changing very dramatically with time, there was a tendency for an up increase in, in lake effect snow. So lake effect uh, uh, has been increasing with time. And there have been several other studies that have uh, shown that as well. Um, I'll show this example. This is, um, these are uh, little time series of um, the amount of precipitation measured at all of these different sites around Lake Michigan and how it changes with time from about 1909 to uh, about 1990, uh, so, or 1980. So each of these is a time series showing uh, how the precipitation changed throughout the 20th century. And you can see that on the western side of the lake, there are some increases in snowfall, not a huge amount, but, um, you know, but uh, little increases. Um, and also far from far to the east of Lake Michigan, there there are some interesting patterns and changes going on. Uh, not nearly as dramatic though as very close to the lake. Uh, this is Holland, Michigan, for example, and you can see that there's uh, the the amount of snow that they got uh, during the winter increased dramatically in the 1970s. Um, and what that tells us is that lake effect is uh, very very sensitive to small changes in the overall atmosphere. Uh, these are mean temperatures and minimum temperatures. Uh, um, these are data from the uh, Midwestern Regional Climate Center uh, looking at uh, temperatures uh, in this region, I believe at Muskegon, and showing that during this big increase, this time period of a big increase in snow, there were very minor changes in the uh, mean and, and minimum temperatures. You had a, a bit of a cold snap in the late 1960s. Um, uh, that accompanied these changes. And so lake effect really is quite sensitive to, to regional temperature as well as some other factors that, uh, that we'll talk about if we have time. So summarizing what some of the previous findings were, uh, these are um, uh, a number of uh, papers. Uh, Bram and Dungy looked at snow from 1909 or so to the 1980s and saw a general increase. Uh, Norton and Bolsenga did, uh, Burnett did, as I showed you a few minutes ago, um, Ellis and Johnson. These are all studies that tended to see uh, uh, increasing lake effect snowfall, not necessarily an increase of snow far from the lakes. So something's changing with the lake effect, and, and uh, we're not entirely sure what that, uh, what that is. Um, Ken Kunkel is the most recent uh, paper, Kunkel et al., uh, and they also found an increase, but not quite at the rate that these earlier studies tended to see. Uh, so what are the reasons for this? Well, Ellison Johnson felt that 
uh, or found that uh, decreasing average air temperatures through the 1980s uh, uh, were associated with the increase in lake effect snow. And that kind of makes sense. If you have more cold air blowing across the Great Lakes, uh, there would be more opportunities for lake effect snow to develop. And that's very similar to what Bram and Dungey found. Uh, Burnett, uh, in 2003, uh, certainly saw uh, changes in air temperatures, but also uh, focused on the important processes related to the lakes themselves. Um, felt, uh, he found that uh, lake surface temperatures uh, tended to increase, that decreased the amount of ice that formed on the lakes, and that meant there was more open water where you can get heat and moisture uh, fluxes from the lakes, and that would generate your storms. So, um, so all these uh, processes are related, but they, but it's, uh, there are a lot of questions as to uh, why we saw these changes. So Luke Bard, a uh, student currently working with me here at the University of Illinois, uh, was looking in more detail at how these trends have changed around Lake Michigan. And to figure out, to determine how much, uh, how snow has changed over time, he would compare the amount of snow uh, on the west side of the lakes, far from the lakes, to the amount of snow measured right in the snow belts, right in the heaviest area uh, where lake effect almost always uh, has some impact. And that gave him an estimate of how, uh, how much snow was received each year. And you could look at that over time, uh, over the last century, and see uh, how lake effect has changed. And what he found was something rather shocking, uh, that really what came as a big surprise to us, that up here in the northern or central uh, areas of Lake Michigan, the lake effect uh, uh, snows tended to increase, uh, like everyone reported, uh, from the early 1900s until the 1970s or so when it reached a peak. But surprisingly, it didn't keep going up. It started decreasing over time. And we uh, saw, uh, actually, in this particular case, a, a gradual decrease from the uh, 70s and early 80s. Uh, to 2005. Uh, down, moving down to the center of the lake, you have a general pattern, but it's not quite as dramatic. Uh, general increase, general decrease, but not nearly at the magnitude of uh, the precip of the snow up north. When you get further south, lake effect has, um, you need certain kinds of lake effect snow bands to, to affect places like Valparaiso, and uh, the trends are not nearly as obvious. So we found something that was quite different than what other, uh, other studies had found. Um, and it raises some important questions. What could cause these, this uh, reversal in the amount of snow that was received in the Great Lakes area? Uh, is it a local effect? Well, the, uh, some studies did see little hints that, that there was a decrease starting uh, after the 1980s. Uh, is it only around Lake Michigan that this, that this occurred? Uh, many of the other um, studies were conducted for lakes, uh, for the eastern lakes, Lake Ontario and Lake Erie uh, and Lake Huron. Um, you know, perhaps Lake Michigan is a little different. Um, is, this, is there less snow falling because it's too warm, that the snow is basically being replaced by rain? Well, we found that, uh, or Luke found that when he looked at this trend and looked at the total amount of rainfall, he generally got the same pattern. So it, this doesn't seem to be uh, an important effect. Uh, are there changes in large-scale atmospheric circulations or winter temperature variations? Uh, are the clouds themselves changing? Are the, are the clouds, be, um, um, are, you know, how much ice there is in the clouds? Is that changing over time? We really don't know, and we uh, there are a lot of good questions that we really need to look at. So let's. What about the future? Well, uh, looking at heavy precipitation, as I showed you before, um, uh, our group found a, a general increase in extreme precipitation and the heaviest precipitation over time. And many of the, uh, the, the models are showing similar trends where uh, even though there might be minor changes in the total precipitation, maybe even decreases the drying out over time, the, uh, the frequency of the very heaviest rains might be increasing. So the, the, the most damaging of the rains might, uh, might be uh, more common in the future. Uh, and that seems to be uh, related um, 
uh, right now the, the most uh, likely reason for that is more vapor in the air due to uh, warming ocean temperatures. Uh, what about snow? Well, that's an open question. Uh, Burnett uh, argued, at least for the foreseeable future, that uh, as there was less ice, there should be increases in lake effect snow, and that might be occurring on the eastern lakes. Uh, in the long run, there may be decreases in lake effect snow as the temperature, uh, as the air temperature goes up and it's replaced by rain. Uh, our observations show a little bit of both, an increase and then a, then a decrease. So that's really an open question. We still need to, to find out how widespread that is. So I think I'll end there, and uh, thank you all for your uh, attention, and I look forward to hearing some questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kristovich. Um, we have gotten some great questions during the presentation, so let me uh, get started and ask, uh, ask you as many as we can what questions Dr. Kristovich doesn't answer today by one we'll post later on the website with his answers. Um, so let me uh, start with, and let me pull them up, I'm sorry. I'm in, you were too fast for me, okay. Um, <laughs> Have the trends in the Great Lakes um, extreme pre precipitation events matched closely with the trends or fluctuations in the lake levels? Uh, in general, over the long term, yes, there is there's a, um, well, in terms of total precipitation, there there's a good, uh, good correspondence. There are a lot of processes that affect uh, lake levels, including how much uh, water we take out, uh, the amount of uh, water flowing into the lakes, the amount of water flowing out. But there's a, a pretty good correspondence with the total precipitation. Um, I'm not so sure that, that extreme precipitation uh, has the same type of effect. Uh, if you tend to have a dry year, but it rains particularly heavily on July 15th, for example, and then again in September and so forth, uh, that wouldn't have a very large uh, influence on the lake levels. So I would say that there really hasn't been a um, uh, hasn't been shown that there's a strong uh, influence of the extreme precipitation, but certainly the um, total precipitation over a long period of time has a big effect. Okay, thank you. Um, have you been able to uh, see a shift in the weather patterns? Do the winter uh, snow events start later in the year today than in the past? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, and there's a, there's quite a bit of discussion about that. It's it's changes in in how the seasons um, uh, occur. Are we getting colder winters early and and uh, uh, earlier than we did before, for example? And that would give uh, more lake effect snow earlier in the season than than we used to get. Um, that's still an open question. Uh, certainly, over the last uh, decade or so, it seems. Uh, and a lot of people have, uh, have argued that uh, we've had colder early seasons in the winter and, and warmer late seasons uh, during the winter. So December, for example, might be particularly cold, but uh, February and March might be warm. But that really um, hasn't been shown to be a, a very consistent pattern in this region. Uh, so I think that's, um, even though it, at times it seems that way, uh, it does vary a lot from year to year, and I think it's still an open question whether or not there's a consistent long-term pattern. Um, I've got a, a great question from the Tecumseh Middle School. Uh, they ask, are there any positive impacts of increased precipitation in the Great Lakes region? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I, I missed part of it. Sure. Um, are there any positive impacts of increased precipitation in the Great Lakes region? Oh, okay, great question. I'm, I'm glad uh, uh, glad you guys at the middle school are listening in. Um, I've, intend I've tended to show the negative impacts in, in this and, and uh, talk about property damage and so forth, but the, the, you bring up an excellent point. It's not always negative. There's, there's a lot of positive impacts. Uh, for example, if uh, you were in the business of renting out uh, snowmobiles, um, an increase in lake effect snowfall would be uh, would have a big positive influence on you. So, um, so certainly there there are a lot of positive impacts of lake effect uh, due to uh, for the tourism industry, for example, for uh, for uh, people who 
are in the business of removing snow or, or repairing from snow damage. Um, uh, so there are a lot of positive impacts as well. And society does tend to, to uh, react well to, to long-term changes in, in snowfall. So businesses tend to go where, um, where people are interested in going. And there are a lot of snow lovers out there. So good question. Another question uh, we have is, um, since cold fronts are the driver of precipitation in the Great Lakes, is there evidence of climate change reducing lake ice coverage, thus increasing lake effect precipitation? OK. Um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. And actually, we've never really looked at it from that standpoint. Um, the, the reason um, it's a, it's a very complicated to, to pick out, as I understand the question, uh, the question is, well, since cold fronts are such a big driver in the, in the heavy precipitation, maybe it's bringing in more cold air and that's uh, affecting lake effect occurrence, if I understand the, the question correctly. And um, uh, we really haven't uh, looked for a link in that, so I'd have to say uh, it's, it's unclear. Uh, the only thing I would point out, uh, however, is uh, there are a number of studies out there that have shown that even though you might be getting uh, uh, changes in frequency of cold fronts, the coldest air that, that develops to the north um, uh, tends to be developing less frequently. Uh, the, there's kind of a warming of this cold air as it comes in. Um, so it's really not at all obvious how these things uh, um, are related to one another. Uh, the other issue is that lake effect uh, tends to be a, uh, a winter process. And uh, as, I, as we talked about before, uh, the heavy, very heavy precipitation uh, tends to occur more in the warm season and, and, the, um, and the fall as well. So it's not clear. It's a good question. Um, and we really just don't know yet. OK. Um, and another uh, question, an overall question of how does all of this compare to the rest of the world? Ooh, that is an excellent question. Um, it, the, these things tend to, uh, when you're talking about precipitation changes due to climate change or uh, temperature changes, uh, there are some overall patterns. Um, there, there's an, an overall pattern of, of warming that, that we've seen in much of the world. Um, there also tends to be uh, a more rapid uh, interchange of the uh, hydrologic cycle. So you have more evaporation, it's warmer, it's causing heavier precipitation. So that whole process is, is, uh, has been seen to speed up in a lot of locations. Uh, however, it is not at all constant. Precipitation is quite variable, uh, and precipitation trends are extremely variable. Um, uh, in the West, for example, there's been a tendency for drying out. Uh, very heavy precipitation occurs. But, um, but the, the largest trends in heavy precipitation tend to be east of the Rockies. So, uh, so there really are very, um, so it's, it is rather localized how, how the atmosphere is reacting to climate change in general. So good question. Uh, another question we have is, would you expect future trends in lake effect snowfall to be different downwind of each of the individual Great Lakes? OK, um, would the trends be different for uh, Lake Huron, for example, different than uh, Lake Erie? Yes. And the answer is absolutely. Uh, that, that you would fully expect. Uh, I can give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, one example is that uh, now, on uh, most years, Lake Erie tends to freeze in the uh, in the February uh, time period, February uh, March uh, time period. Well, uh, that ice that forms on the lake surface tends to cut off the heat and moisture coming up from the surface. So, if you tend to warm the atmosphere, uh, the effect would be to melt off, uh, uh, you know, make the ice occur less often less of the lake might, lake might be covered. And that would, uh, you would expect that to lead to more lake effect snow. And that's, that's what um, uh, Burnett et al. Uh, pointed out, that that could be an important uh, factor. 
uh, if you look more uh, to um, uh, more of the southern uh, lakes, uh, Lake Michigan, for example, uh, over time, as the atmosphere warms, lake effect snow might be expected to decrease because it would fall in the form of rain rather than snow. Uh, areas further north, uh, such as near Lake Superior, um, since it's much colder up there, even a little bit of warming would tend to increase snow. Uh, you know, very little of it would call, fall as rain. So yes, um, uh, each of the lakes have their own uh, physical properties that um, uh, that would affect uh, lake effect in different ways. And that's why it's really important to, to uh, look at all the lakes, not just uh, one or two, and to uh, carefully try to understand the uh, different processes and different trends. Okay. Uh, I think this reference is around slide 24. Um, we have um, one attendee that asked, is there a trend in peak three or six hour rainfall quantities? Oh, okay. Um, I think it was around slide 24. Right, yeah. I, I, um, slide 24 is around, uh, that's still in the lake effect snow. Um, it sounds like they're talking about the short term uh, very heavy precipitation, and I'd have to say that I I have to say I don't know. Um, we uh, most of the data sets I've been talking about really do not observe uh, precipitation on on short time periods, um, and many of the data sets out there um, uh, you know, there aren't many data sets available that would tell us much about precipitation trends on time periods of less than a day. Um, that's a good question, though. I'll look into it a little bit more. Uh, so uh, perhaps you can increase, uh, keep that question on the list that you sent me. Um, but at this moment, I'm not aware of any, uh, any evidence that's shown that. But I'm not so sure we've had the data to show that. OK. Um, one question we had uh, is dealing with the, the recent um, algal blooms. This question is asking, could the lower ice cover and warming of the lakes earlier and longer contribute to the blue-green algae blooms increasing? Um, that's an excellent question. And um, it's really not my area of expertise. I really can't speak to uh, how algal blooms uh, respond. Um, but from my limited uh, understanding of, of these processes, um, having a warmer water surfaces uh, that, that warm up more rapidly in the spring and last longer into the year. Uh, my understanding is that should uh, have a tendency to increase um, uh, uh, you know, biological activity of all sorts and, and algae blooms. So it would make sense to me. But uh, again, that's, there are a lot of processes going on. There's uh, a lot of other issues related to all this pollution and, and um, and other other things, so um, I can't really fully answer that since it's outside. Okay, it's a good question though. Um, have you looked at variations in precipitation during the year seasonally? Uh, we have done some work on that, um, and uh, uh, Ken Kunkel and uh, Dave Easterling and 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 others have looked at uh, seasonality to some extent. And um, uh, as I pointed out, uh, at least in the uh, 48 lower 48 states of the U.S. Uh, there's this um, uh, the the biggest changes, the biggest trends are in the uh, warm season or early fall, uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons that we started looking at uh, tropical cyclones in more detail and, and published a paper on that uh, because that's the time period when they occur. Uh, so yes, there's a distinct seasonality, and a lot of that has to do with uh, warmer temperatures in the warm season uh, uh, allow you to condense more of the moisture in the air uh, into rain, and and so you could get heavier precipitation in the uh, in the warm season. So yes, a very distinct uh, seasonality. One question uh, we have, and um, it's dealing with almost kind of putting you on the spot here of whether or not you um, believe that the, the root cause of the extreme precipitation events are a normal geological phenomenon, or are they from climate change? 
uh, are they from climate change? And I'd have to say there's a great deal of evidence that, that uh, climate has been changing over the last hundred years and also over millennia. There, there are very long-term uh, uh, changes that, that have been seen. So, uh, so certainly uh, you would expect precipitation to also react to uh, the large-scale temperature increases, the large-scale atmospheric circulation changes, and so forth. Um, this research really doesn't uh, the research I'm doing really is not focused on the root causes, and I think that's part of the question is why has it been increasing, or why have there been changes over the last century? And uh, that really has not been a focus of this. But if you go in and look at the scientific literature, um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of evidence that uh, humans play a role in in the uh, recent changes in the atmosphere and the uh, uh, that we've seen in the atmosphere. Uh, research, of course, is always going on, and, and scientists are always questioning themselves and questioning each other, and we continue to learn. But that's what the consensus is at this moment, that, that uh, uh, people do have an influence. OK. Um, we have one question um, dealing with atmospheric uh, deposition. Um, this question is, when concerned about atmospheric deposition of contaminants, are lake effect events higher in atmospheric events or lower in, or higher in, in atmospheric events that are global or um, lower in atmospheric events that are more local? I think I lost you there. <laughs> Would you mind repeating that? Um, when concerned about atmospheric deposition of contaminants, are okay. lake effect events higher in atmospheric events that are global or oh. lower um, oh, okay. atmospheric events that are more local? Right. Are they? Are how important are these these local events compared to to global deposition? Yeah. Um, and that's going to depend a lot on what you're talking about um, being deposited. Um, uh, certainly, the the winter, the the uh, the types of atmospheric pollution that you have, different uh, particles in the air, uh, change quite a bit from winter to summer, um, you know, for various reasons. Um, and uh, many of the contaminants in the atmosphere um, are absorbed well in precipitation and, and deposited to the surface. Um, I think it would be an excellent question. It's a question I um, uh, really have wanted to look at. Uh, you would expect um, areas that have more precipitation to have more opportunity to um, to wash out pollution from the atmosphere and deposit it to the ground. Uh, that's kind of a general statement of, of um, uh, particles in the atmosphere. Um, so it's entirely possible that lake effect uh, has a, an important local impact. It, I wouldn't expect it to be a large-scale impact. One thing that lake effect has going against it, however, is that lake effect storms tend to be rather shallow. Uh, uh, if, if you look at the how deep the clouds get and how high up in the atmosphere the precipitation forms, it's usually only in the lowest uh, few kilometers of the atmos atmosphere. So if you're talking about pollution that is mixed throughout the lower, uh, throughout the troposphere, throughout the lower atmosphere, um, lake effect would be struggling to keep up with summertime thunderstorms, for example. Um, so in general, uh, kind of in summary, it hasn't been looked at. I'm not aware of anyone who who's really studied that in detail. Uh, I think it's an excellent question, and I'd be I would fully expect local impacts from the lakes. But I think uh, if you average over the year and, and over over the earth, uh, you probably have uh, more deposition of pollutants due to deeper systems uh, like thunderstorms in warm season. Gut feeling. <laughs> OK. Um, we have a, a question um, from OK, uh, do you have a method to determine if the decline in lake effect snow is due to increased rainfall replacing snowfall? Uh, great question. And, and yes, that's, uh, 
um, didn't have a lot of time to uh, talk about it uh, with the, the short summary talk here. Um, one thing, there are two uh, different types of measurements that are taken. Uh, one is snowfall amount um, uh, during the winter, and, and you know that's taken at many locations of, uh, around the Great Lakes area. But there's also uh, precipitation, and what the precipitation measurements are of every type of precipitation that falls to the ground, uh, including snow, including rain. Um, and so you can compare the precipitation measurements, which are combined rain and snow, and see if that has the same pattern as uh, lake effect snowfall. Uh, Luke has, has done that for these, uh, for these areas, and he found very, very similar patterns. Uh, in snow, as we talked about, uh, snow tended to increase uh, into the 70s and 80s and then decrease, uh, at least in the, this region. Uh, precipitation, which was the combination of rain and snow, did a very similar pattern. Uh, it tended to go up uh, and then decrease. Um, so right now we don't see a lot of evidence that this um, that this pattern is a uh, change of lake effect snow into lake effect rain, just by that by comparing those two measurements. Um, uh, it doesn't really answer the question of why does this overall pattern change, um, but that is a question that we can look at, and I think we need to continue to. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one question um, asking about how um, your research that you summarized today uh, benefited from the uh, UN's IPCC model. Could you talk a little bit about that? How, uh, how my uh, study benefited? Um, yeah. That is a very good question. Very, uh, uh, science, as science grows, it tends to, to depend uh, greatly on, on research that was done uh, before, and um, even though um, I don't think I showed any research that was uh, directly related to uh, the IPCC reports, uh, certainly the uh, the findings of the IPC, uh, IPCC showing that there are big changes, that there are large impacts uh, due to climate change, there's a lot of evidence. Um, that is one of the motivations for us doing this study and, and caused us to want to look at lake effect snow trends in more detail or heavy precipitation trends. Um, so certainly it, uh, um, the IPCC, as any kind of re scientific research uh, impacts, tends to impact all areas of research, causing more people to be interested, for example, in, in climate change research. Um, I. So in an indirect way, it certainly does influence uh, our work and, and, and you know, many other scientists, but not in a direct sense. We, didn't, we haven't used that, uh, their findings directly in any way. Okay. Um, one last question um, before we close. Um, many climate projections are based upon the conservative estimate of future emissions, and current emissions are far outpacing these estimates. Do you have uh, an opinion about the impact on the trends you've discussed in that higher emission scenario? Yeah, the, the, uh, uh, the model simulations uh, by intent uh, actually go from, uh, go from a, a quite a range of, of emission scenarios from uh, uh, to very extreme emission scenarios to, to lower uh, emission scenarios. Uh, so there, there is that that range, and um, uh, and I'm not really sure how current trends are, um, uh, emission trends are related to this. Uh, but if I understand right, the question is how uh, would that impact what we expect in lake effect? Yeah. Is, is that the question? Or okay. Yeah. Um, really, it's not an easy answer. Uh, uh, you know, we um, I had talked about uh, the fact that lake effect responds differently with different lakes due to uh, whether or not the lakes tend to freeze in the winter, uh, how warm the lakes get, uh, when the cold air comes down over the Great Lakes. Um, you know, does the cold air come in before the lakes have a chance to uh, uh, 
before the lakes have a chance to cool off a lot or not. Um, so it's very complex, and it's it's not a straightforward answer. But if we look at the trends that we're seeing around Lake Michigan, um, there does seem to be uh, this ongoing decreasing trend, um, at least in, in middle parts of Lake Michigan. And, and I don't see a reason for that to change in the, in the long run, even if uh, emissions go up. Um, but as I said, that said, it's not a straightforward answer. It's, it's, uh, there are a lot of processes going on, and we need to do more studies on that link between large-scale uh, emissions, large-scale circulations, and these local-scale phenomena. It's an important area of research. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we have some other questions, but we're going to save those. I will send those all to uh, Dr. Kristovich, and he said he was going to be willing to answer those questions. We'll post those up with uh, the archive of this webinar. Um, so I just would like to uh, close. We wanted to, again, thank Dr. Kristovich for his uh, willingness to talk to us today about uh, Great Lakes weather and the impacts uh, we could face with a changing climate, a really excellent discussion. Uh, also, a thank you to NOAA, National Sea Grant College Program, and OSU Extension for funding this webinar. I did want to remind you that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature, and please uh, take a few minutes to fill that out. I also wanted to refer you to the resources and, and the archive of all the previous webinar presentations, which are located on our changingclimate.osu.edu website. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by the OSU Climate Change Outreach Team and will continue next month with a presentation by Ohio State University's uh, Dr. Bill Mitch, who will be discussing the role Great Lakes wetlands will play in a changing climate. Again, uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Kristovich and all the participants on this webinar. We hope that this was beneficial and hope you'll uh, join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon.